our practice, I would say it's practice, is that uh, only those who have been examined and absolved go to the Lord's Supper. So what we're doing here, this class, is the examination. So I'm asking you, we ask questions, you ask me questions. I'm basically saying, helping you actually along the line to say, do I believe what this church believes or not, you know? And then, and that part of the problem is that people think of, we can talk more about this another time, but they think of the, sup, the Lord's Supper as about um, only in the vertical kind of dimension we've talked about before. Like this is between me and God, which it is, um, but it's also communion with one another. So you're being joined not only to Christ, but to the rest of the church. So this is a little bit, it's a little bit harder to demonstrate from the scriptures, although I think it's possible. Welcome. Um, is that to the altars that you, this has been the teaching of the church for almost the entire history. Um, that where you commune, you also believe and confess the same faith that they, that they do. So um, before one communes, then it's appropriate to be examined so that you can say, and we can both say honestly. Some of this has to do with the fact that pastors are called to a, um, a, what I would suggest is an uncomfortable office or role, which is um, what Paul calls the steward of the mysteries. So uh, a steward is someone who distributes, in this case, the mysteries, referring to the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the Lord's gifts and the sacraments. Um, so I have to take seriously what God's word um, has said about those who um, are to receive this. And this is actually a great question to lead into to baptism because the instructions attached to baptism are different than the instructions attached to the Lord's Supper. Meaning um, before baptism, we don't go through class. I mean, Jackson's actually heard heard a lot of God's word, right? Right, but, um, but that's not necessary in a sense because Jesus hasn't actually commanded that. There, there actually is maybe a point of conflict. That, I don't know if it's a conflict for you. It might be a conflict, which is to say, well, which comes first, baptism or faith? Right, people always ask this question. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Marla, is that um, when the Lord... The Lord gives faith in baptism, but it's faith that says something like uh, Philip's on the road. He's one of the apostles. He's on the road after Jesus ascended with a, with a eunuch from Ethiopia who served in the queen's court, which we don't have to talk about why the queen would make her servants eunuchs. That's a whole other story. But, I mean, it actually makes sense. If you have a queen, you don't want to have male servants that are, you know, have all their parts, I guess, for obvious reason. Maybe that's obvious. I don't know. You're all ladies, you know what's going on. <laughs> it's not safe for the queen. Um, so he's a eunuch anyway, it doesn't matter. He's there on behalf of the queen. And um, Philip is teaching him, uh, well, the eunuch actually has a scroll from the book of Isaiah. So he has a, a whole scroll of Isaiah, which is one of the longest books in the Bible. So to own a scroll of Isaiah, like in US dollars, it's like $2,000. Right? This is not an inexpensive scroll to own. People didn't have like whole Bibles like we do. So he's got the scroll of Isaiah and he's been reading it because that's what the Ethiopian queen, his, 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 um, his uh, master, I guess, or mistress, he's been reading it and he's like, tell me what this means. And so then Philip, the apostle, teaches him you know, what, what Isaiah is talking about, that it's all fulfilled in Jesus, this prophecy of Jesus. And then the eunuch asks this crazy question. He says, what's to, then here's water, what's to prevent me from being baptized? They say it's it's crazy because it's like where did you get baptism from Isaiah, right? Which maybe he knew something of it because of you know both John the Baptist and Jesus. Um, but either way, he clearly desires baptism in faith, right? He's heard God's word and now he's like, what's why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip's like, now this of course has all sorts of baggage attached to it too because, um, let's see, one he's not a Jew, the eunuch right? He's from Ethiopia. Two, he's a eunuch, which in the Old Testament, these people were excluded from, from the life of the church. If you had been mutilated in such a way, you weren't, you weren't allowed into the temple because you were unholy. You had been desecrated. Um, now in, now in, the, in the Christian church, not only are Gentiles included, servants even, 
you know, her slave. He's actually a slave, a slave, but also one who's been disfigured, you know, castrated. He's also, there's not only forgiveness, but there's the promise of res resurrection, which includes restoration of his body, of course, and life everlasting. And that's all a gift to him. So it's really a remarkable story when it comes to baptism. But there in that story, um, Philip, Philip's answer is, uh, there's nothing to prevent you from being baptized, right? Now, was it because he had just heard God's word? You know, so he had been suitably instructed? Maybe, maybe not. I, there, there are traditions then in the church, but these are traditions, not from God's word, that would say, like with, uh, with infants or, or children, we're generally just baptized. But with adults, you might want to go through some instruction first. Um, but that generally has only been the case uh, when the church has been in, under persecution, because like under Roman persecution. So the Roman gov government would send adults um, to, to infiltrate the church, to try to find out, because they were meeting in secret. So then to infiltrate and then um, be baptized, and then they would be accepted into the full communion, and then they could name names, right? And so, and this happened. So then, in many places under persecution, the church would do a pretty thoroughgoing examination years before they would be baptized. But they would also then use all that instruction before baptism as their instruction for the Lord's Supper. So they'd be baptized, and then they'd immediately go to the supper the same day. Like, they'd go literally from the baptistry, walk into the church, and then celebrate the Lord's Supper. So that's like in Alexandria, it was one such place. We have documentation of this. Now, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, which there was a question before you got here, Dasha, about, um, no, I prefer you, because I, I, I tend to get like so focused on the material that I don't necessarily give time for questions. So if you have a question from last week or whatever, at the beginning is the best, because then we just take as much time as we have for other things. Um, okay, we'll get to that. Maybe it doesn't. I can always make it have to do with something, usually. He brought self into... That's right. mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what were we saying? Oh, the Lord's Supper does have some specific instruction from the Apostle Paul. Um, and this is, was uh, something happening in the church of Corinth where there were people receiving the Lord's Supper outside of faith. And um, this is where we get the instruction from the Apostle to say, let, let each man examine himself before coming to the Supper. Uh, and like I say, we're, I'm facilitating that. We're, we're going through, you know, going through the scriptures because I also had that role of being um, a steward. Uh, and the reason was is that people were receiving it not for forgiveness of sins, which is what the word itself says, um, but were receiving it either as gluttons or to be drunk, which tells you that they were not taking little Jesus jigglers, but they're actually, you know, from the chalice taking a nice big gulp, right? More than once. Maybe going back up again. Anyway, it was a scandal. And the people who were receiving it, not in faith, were also living in unrepentant lives. So there was that too. So they had not, their lives had not been examined in such a way to say, repent for the king. That there was a father who was having an affair with his daughter-in-law. It's, it's a total mess. It's all in the book. You can read it. it sounds like a soap opera. Right. But, but um, Paul says, and, he, and he's right about this, is that he says, that's why some of you have gotten sick and have died. Now we don't have, ex we don't know if they actually physically died, but we do know it's faith killing. So to receive the supper outside of faith is to receive it to your judgment, which is why we have all this examination. So to answer, that's the question, but we're, we're pretty far along. I mean, we only have a couple more chapters, right? I mean, 12, I think. Right. So we're going to do baptism today. <laughs> baptism doesn't have that same kind of instruction to it. Now this, you, uh, you have another question that I need to answer before I forget which was, what about sponsors? So now, now that you've got that background, I have, there's a method to the madness here. Now that you have that background, if, if you were in a persecuting church and people were infiltrating, um, that's one issue. But in the same such situation, um, you're, I mean, you're basically living in a, a totally pagan culture, generally speaking. So this is especially in the Gentile territories. We'll use Corinth again as an example. So people are coming that meet the description that Jesus talks about as who comes into the kingdom. Not only tax collectors, but we have, we have prostitutes, we have, um, we have thieves, we have, I don't know, figure out like what? Murderers. Murderers, yes. We have all sorts of people 
that are coming to be baptized. All right. And now we have a concern that having been baptized, um, we don't want them to make shipwreck of that faith that's given in baptism and then to deny the Holy Spirit because that Jesus talks about what happens when you deny the Holy Spirit given to you in baptism. Is the, the, that's the only damnable offense is actually to deny the Spirit. To deny the Spirit is to deny the Word. So they were having issues with people being baptized kind of without much instruction, but then kind of flaking out right away and going back to their old way of life. And then sometimes coming back to church and now bringing that basically what is a scandal now back into the church, a stumbling block, because these people, they don't actually believe Jesus' word about what it says about their old way of life, right? And now they're living contrary to that, right? Of course, there's people who don't want to go back to it, who sincerely in faith don't want to, and yet fall back into their old ways. And, you know, boy, we have expression for this, fall off the wagon, right? Yeah, that's a different story. <clears throat> um, and, and navigating that is challenging, right? So, yes, you can be restored, but if you're living rebellious against your baptism and using your baptism as like a license, basically, to do whatever you want, oh, I'm going to be forgiven, I can just do whatever I want. You have to contradict God's word to do that. So what they did is they appointed sponsors. This was especially true for adults. So that, just like in, this is where Alcoholics Anonymous got it. They got it from baptism. He was a Christian, the guy who wrote it. He just kind of excised, over time they excised all the God, not the God stuff, but the specifically Christian stuff. <laughs> There's God talk in it, but it could, it doesn't, it's not terribly specific to Christian. But it, it was at the beginning. And so the sponsors in AA are like sponsors for baptism, right? That they, they check in on you, make sure, you know, how, how are you, how's your sobriety going? In this case, how's your baptism going, right? Right, right. And so you've seen that. Um, I think, you know, for Teresa, that's, that's Barb. Barb's keeping an eye on you, right? So I mean, she's functioning like a, well, I mean, family friends, right? But, that, but that's the role is is to, uh, you know, I don't want you to fall off the wagon or, you know, to absent yourself from the gifts. So um, when it comes to children with baptism, it's a little bit different when it sponsors then, right? Because what are we taught? Like, their parents are the ones who are responsible for them. So then over time, we've had a kind of a tradition of godparents um, or sponsors that are like, mm, basically, uh, you know, they have, what, what is it, power of attorney or something? Or, like if the parents die, then right. the, the... parents die, then the godparents are the parents. Right. That, historically, it's been attached to baptism now for a long time, but that wasn't, that wasn't orig originally part of it. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. Um, you should designate in a will or, <laughs> you know, right. people to care for um, children right. until they're grown. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Family courts are not helpful on this. Um, but are essentially supposed to be like their sponsors? Yes. So to say, okay, you've been baptized, um, that means that, that you continue in the Lord's teaching, that, yeah, that you show up. Um, so I'm going to check in on you, right? And, and it could be material too. Make sure, you know, body and life, the whole thing, the whole person. Um, but also with baptism, there's... Okay. Oh, by the way, one more thing on sponsors. Sponsors um, almost always are members of the same congregation, right? Otherwise, they can't notice if you're not in church. <laughs> so to say, to have sponsors that are like distant relatives, like I had my aunt and uncle. Well, they lived in Indianapolis. I lived in Lafayette. We were an hour apart. Um, they trusted my parents, you know, rightly, um, that they would take, get me to church, right? But it's a little harder for them to check in on me and make sure if my parents were kind of deadbeats, you know, to, which they weren't, you know, but to like, are you in church? Are you, are you hearing God's word? You know, how's, how, you know, you have conflict of faith, you have questions about what you believe, all of that. Uh, whereas if they were in the same parish, then, I mean, they, you could literally sit together on Sunday. Yeah. So that, and that, and that still could be true for children too. So it'd be good to see the, if you had sponsors, it's good to see see them there. But I think for like Jackson, it's, you know, it's grandma and grandpa, you know, would be an example of that. So if you could um, get everybody together on the same Sunday, which I know is kind of hit or miss, depending on what's going on, right? Hmm. 
Hmm. Uh, there is a second. There is a second role of sponsors, um, and that's the role of witness. So the the scripture actually has. Uh, there's mandates about things that are done in the Lord's name, is that they be done um, with two or three witnesses. There's Old Testament stuff, uh, but by extension, it goes into the New Testament, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So God has promised to be there, um, but but never alone. Uh, this is one of the areas the Roman church gets the Lord's Supper wrong, is that you can pay the priest to offer the Lord's Supper without anybody there, which is kind of weird because then you're like, one, I don't know if you actually did it or if I just gave you money and you said you did it, right? And two, like, what's the point of having the supper if nobody's there to receive it? That's another problem. Um, but that, that idea of the two or three witnesses, uh, that was still true in, in courts until pretty recently. Now with, you're talking about the issues with courts. Now it's... Um, not even video testimony is acceptable, although it's more acceptable than wit eyewitness testimony, right? It's primarily DNA and other kind of forensic testimony is what they use now, right? So essentially you have to have somebody legally written up stating that these people are your godparents? Yeah, so well, not, not legally as far as the state goes, but legally as far as the church goes. Yeah, so we keep record of, your, of a baptism here. We have, we have uh, official records. Right, but then you also have, uh, you should have witnesses, right? So you could have, for Jackson, you could have, you know, actually you as parents serve as witnesses, but it could be somebody else too, if you wanted to have a witness. Yes, but I think what you're saying with... Oh, in court? But yeah, but it's for documentation. Mm -hmm. Mom, yeah, mom and dad did. Oh. You know, the car accident. Sorry, just because the church says those are your godparents, mm -hmm. automatically. Yes. The court system. The court won't accept that. that child, right? No, court doesn't accept that. That's correct. Probably. So then wouldn't that be no. 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 They'll use it as like a secondary document. Like if you need to get a birth certificate and prove who your parents are and they and you don't have and they have issues with their records, which happened in our case. <laughs> um, because Patrick was born at home. No, not at home. Not Patrick. James was born at home. And for some reason the witness, which was the midwife, didn't like submit the form. She actually wasn't there. <laughs> she didn't get there in time. I had to. I had to deliver my own son, which was kind of fun. That's cool. Yeah, it was kind of fun. It's very. It's like. It's a memory that you can't get out of your head. Because <laughs> it was also the, just the position she wanted to be in. And everything. It was just like this is not. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That part. Um, but it took like us a year to get the the county to like just give us a birth certificate. Because I'm signing affidavits. The we eventually did get the midwife to testify, but, but the baptism certificate was part of it, which was interesting because that was my name on there too. But, you know, but there were witnesses that, because, because we put on the baptism certificate, we also indicate the day of birth and the place. And that some of this is historically was legal today. It's not so, but yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, and some of that is a remnant of what happened in, in countries where they adopted the Christian faith as the official religion of the state, which I would suggest is not a good idea, but many of these places were Lutheran, some Calvinist too, Reformed. Um, obviously, historically Roman Catholic, that the, the Roman Empire was the, and the Roman Catholic Church were effectively the same thing during the time of the, of the medieval period. So baptism was also to become a citizen of the state. So in order to be, become a citizen of your country, you also had to be baptized. Now that's a confusion, right? Because it's like baptism makes you a part of the kingdom of God, right? Uh, part of the church. But does it make you part of a particular state? So their, their state was recognizing baptism as a right of admission to um, being a citizen. So then that actually made kind of a mess of baptism. Because it's supposed to be in faith and for faith, right? Um, and not, but then you have people just being baptized so that they could get the rights of, of citizen in their state. Whatever that might be. If it was a country or a city or it depends, um, you know, even just to get the benefits of like protection or whatever kind of social welfare they had or whatnot, whatever the king provided. So, yeah, so there's been a lot of confusion about baptism. And uh, I would suggest that baptism is or was the catalyst for the Lutheran Reformation. So and it was it was this, right at the center of the conflict between 
um, the medieval church and Luther and, and those and his fellow, you know, reformers, because um, baptism was at the time of the Reformation was just a secondary thing. It wasn't that really that important. It wasn't that anybody didn't get baptized. Everybody got baptized, but they there was no there was no faith in it. There was no trust. There wasn't a daily living in baptism, even though that's what Paul says in the scripture. We daily die and rise with Christ in our baptism. <clears throat> they didn't think of themselves as children of God then. They thought of themselves as children of the state, right? And that was synonymous for them, which is weird. Um, to the point where even the Roman church didn't really emphasize baptism so much until our lifetimes. Um, the Second Vatican Council, which was um, commenced in the 50s, and went into the 60s. It was a council uh, on reforming. It was a reform council for the Roman church on, on baptism to, to bring greater emphasis to the, to the gift of baptism um, and also instruction of adults and youth, which then follows baptism. So most of the reforms that happened, people always talk about like, you know, the things they did to the service where you like, you didn't have to have Latin in church and they had English um, or whatever your native language was which was also a thing the Reformation did, but you know, it only took 400 years, 450 years to catch up. That's fine. And the same thing with baptism. We were Reformation baptism. It took them a few hundred years to catch up on that, but that's fine. Um, it's not fine, but it, thanks be to God they did, right? And um, so, so that, that's persisted for a long time. People didn't really think of their baptism as all that significant, but that's shifted um, with the Reformation and then later for other churches as well. It's also a source of contention with some churches because what um, some teach, not very many, but uh, today they're called the Baptists, which is kind of ironic, is they, <laughs> because they deny baptism for children. Now why? We should talk about this. So they have relations to let people choose to be baptized? Yep, yep. And they have, uh, it depends on which Baptist you talk to, you know, just like Lutherans, we're not all the same. Same with Baptists. Um, but generally speaking, they, they hold to an idea of an age of accountability. There's a point where you can make decisions for yourself. It's kind of like a rite of passage time. Um, usually it's around age 12 for them. Where at age 12, you might, they might start asking you, so do you want to be baptized? But before that, what they, what they think of, um, they think of being included in God's family in terms of um, the Old Testament, where... Um, where as long as you were a part of the, the tribe, you were like under the umbrella. So your parents' faith actually kind of is like an umbrella that shields, that covers you. That's how they would think of it. And there, there is some truth to that. I mean, your parents teach you the faith, right? Which does provide some protection and shield. I've seen memes, especially with Pride Month, they like this, where you have, um, you know, parents with like shields, a father with a shield and protecting their kids from all the rainbow darts and things, you know, which, you know, it's a meme, but but it gets to the idea is that that's part of the parental role and they do that and the shield is God's word, right? Same thing with, I've seen it with umbrellas as well with the parent holding the umbrella and the kids and the, all the rainbow stuff is coming down on it um, because that's contrary to God's word. So what were you saying? Oh, so that's how they think of, they think of like the parent's faith is kind of this umbrella that, that covers them until, um, they can no longer, but until they can actually make a decision for themselves. So everything there is driven by the idea of a decision, deciding for Jesus, which, yeah, whose side are you on? That kind of language. And there's two problems with that. Um, the first problem is, is that faith is not a decision. Squirrel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see your posts about it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's fine. It's okay. I'm easily distracted too. It takes, it takes great effort for me to stay focused. I get it. I can get myself into like a mental state that I've, I've taught myself to like, yeah, exactly. Like, um, like flow state. So you said that before where you can black out your kids in, yeah. in church and stuff. Mm -hmm. As a mother, 
I cannot. Mm -mm. I don't know that there's many mothers that can do that. I probably agree with that, yeah. So sitting in church with my, my son becomes a butthead, mm -hmm. um, stresses me out beyond belief. Because it's not just trying to discipline him, but also what is everybody else thinking, right? Well, what is everyone else thinking? And I can't mm -hmm. pay attention now. Uh -huh. and <laughs> I'm telling you, last week I almost walked him out and gave him the stinky. I was so crazy. Well, why didn't you? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our practice has always, has always been since Ethan, because Ethan was the worst. Um, I don't know if it's the first is the worst. No. Oh, yeah. No, he's oh terrible. Terrible. Terrible in church. And um, just, it has, it has to be worse to leave than to stay. Now, how you do that, I don't know, but it's a psychological kind of tactic is just to say, you'd rather me, you'd rather sit in this pew than go where we're going to go. Uh -huh. Whatever that looks like. Oh, yeah. However you exercise your discipline, that's fine. So with yeah. And then my stress level goes like this, which then it's like you, right. the next time is. But th this is a great tie-in, actually. So then I want to take him to, to church because they don't want to deal with it again. Right. Now, you might be. You, right. If you don't mind me using him as an example, <laughs> yourself, as yourself, um, one, it's worth it. So if you have to push against it because you, because it's training, right? And uh, two, from, from your perspective, um, the word does what it, what it needs to do, um, even, if we, it, even if it hasn't commanded our full attention the whole time. Ann jokes about this, that she hasn't heard a sermon in 20 years. See? Yeah. See? Right there. And she's not joking. I mean, she, she, and I understand. Like, and it's not just that she hasn't heard, but she hasn't heard and in such a way with focus so that you could remember anything. Right? Yeah. Um, but faith comes by hearing, but does that mean hearing attentively and every word? And no. This is why I do tend to repeat myself in sermons. Um, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It, well, that's a, that, this is why sometimes I start skipping things at the end of the service because some, my child or some other child is, is telling us, telling us we're, we can move on now. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just move on or let's just start singing so that at least that overwhelms it. Right. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, no, you're not. No, I don't think. Walking through Walmart and you hear a child just absolutely throwing a tantrum. Mm -hmm. And you know for a fact the mom is sitting there just dressed to the max. Oh, yeah. Everybody's looking at me. Everybody's right. judging me. I will go out of my way to go. You don't want to No, and it's <laughs> yeah, true. It that's true. Because at the end of the day, sometimes that's all we need to hear. It's yeah. like, you know what? Nobody is judging you. We have all been there. <laughs> now, I, I do think. <laughs> I mean, I do think things have probably changed a little bit as far as culture goes and like expectations of children. Mm -hmm. um, you experience this because not every parent has, brings their child with the same expectation, right, as a teacher. Um, there's probably also some other biochemical stuff going on with attention and, and the use of television and, and internet, you know, by children. And so, I mean, or even by adults that we don't have the patience that we probably did before because we're also like... You know, let's get everything, everything now and fast. So, I mean, I do think things maybe have changed a little bit as far as that goes. But again, it's worth it. Um, you know, like, and that's why I used Ethan as an example because, I'm, you know, they, they do grow, they grow into it and they grow up. Yeah. But the church I came from, I was baptized in and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you sat and you were quiet. Yeah. There was no, yeah. this church is completely relaxed. And I understand it's a difference in time in, in yeah. years also, but it's completely related. I mean, you walked in a church, you sat down, you were quiet, that was it. Yeah. I mean, here it's like, oh, hey, how's it going? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, the, the, the bags for the kids to give them something in mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> well, we could, I mean, and we could argue about that. I mean, I don't know if that, I mean, some parents use it, some parents don't. We don't give our kids very much stuff because it tends to just be more hassle than it's worth because the kids then interact with each other. If you have one, it's different in the pew with you. And Malaya is old enough that it won't really affect too much what Jackson does. Oh, 
Oh, when I was a pastor, uh, let's see. Well, I started going to seminary in 2005, so it would have been five, and then pastor at 10. So, yeah. Um, but also, um, when it comes to Jackson, we should talk about baptism, um, but we'll use him as an example, is we have this really uncomfortable statement that we make in the baptismal rite, um, which is, out unclean spirit, make room for the Holy Spirit. So the, the Spirit is given in many ways. Um, the Spirit is given, but always through God's Word. So he's been hearing God's Word, right? And he's in school or at home or in church. Um, and maybe even from others, grandparents or otherwise. But he hasn't received the gift of the Spirit as he's been promised in baptism. So then we actually do this. I mean, it's an exorcism is what it is. Out unclean spirit, make room for the Holy Spirit. It sounds kind of crazy, right? It's like, we don't, do we actually believe in demon possession? <laughs> um, and, and what we're, well, what we're saying is, you know, in line with Jesus, Jesus says that this world is, is under the sway of the devil. Jesus gave this world to the devil. Well, actually, Adam and Eve did, and, and God said, fine. Um, I'll just make a new heaven, a new earth on the last day, right? And in the meantime, we'll have a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of, you know, the church, which will exist in the world, but not of the world, right? Until Christ comes again. And so, so then uh, what happens with baptism is you're actually removed from the authority and, and sway of the devil in this world and brought into the, uh, under Christ in the church. And now you live in the world where the devils are trying to come after you again because he lost you, right? You were the spoils that Christ had you know, won when he defeated, defeated him. Um, um, but also now you're under you're, you're Christ's own and you're part of his kingdom, which again is in this world, but not of this world. And so then you end up living a double existence. But before that, uh, this was all a long way around to say, you know, some of the resistance you experienced from Jackson, it, it may just be because he hasn't, ha hasn't been baptized. That there's this resistance to God's word because he, he was still born under this way of the devil. Even though he's heard God's word, you know, and he has the spirit that way. That there's, that con there's a conflict going on. Um, I, was, I encourage people not to refer to their children as possessed by the devil, but sometimes people do. Yeah. That little demon child. <laughs> right. Uh, and this is, this is key, too, because this is a distinctive, um, mostly from only Lutherans, uh, but teaching what Paul says in, in Romans um, 7, but you could even broaden that out to Romans 5 through 8, is that we live a double existence. We call this the, the simul, um, simultaneously sinner and saint. So the, sin clings to the flesh. That's the way the Bible talks about it. So we're born into sin, that means according to our body, right? And our body is corrupted by sin, but also our minds and our hearts, the whole person. But then when we're baptized, we're declared children of God and we're given the Holy Spirit. But that Holy Spirit, to quote Paul in Galatians, is at war with the flesh. So now you've got what you might even call an internal civil war happening, right? Where it, Paul talks about it this way in Romans 7. The good that I would do, I don't do. And the things that I want to do, I don't. You know, or wait a minute, the good that I do, I would, the good that I would do, I don't do. I could just bring it up, but it's fine. Um, the things that I keep doing are the things I know I'm not supposed to do. And then, and then he comes to this conclusion, well, who's going to save me from this body of death? He actually calls it this double exit, this conflict, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So then um, elsewhere, you know, the apostle will say like in Titus chapter three, where was that? Dun, 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 Titus chapter three, or, well, here's Romans six. That would work too. But we could do Titus chapter 3 here. Uh, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously. That's not, no, I did want Romans 6. Oh, there we go. St. Paul writes in Romans 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So then what Luther teaches about this is that every day, in a sense, we die in our baptism and we're raised again. We're raised again in new life in Christ. So that you know, everything that is contrary to God's word is put to death again. And drowned in baptism, if you want to use that language too. Oh, yeah, and of course the pattern of that follows the pattern of the day. Um, and the way that, just like Jesus refers to light and darkness. That darkness is the realm of sin and devil and death. Of course, a lot of sin is done at night because it can be done under the cover of darkness, right? So that makes sense too. 
Uh, but then the, the sunrise, the light, um, can sin exist in the dark? Yeah, because you don't see it. But once the light comes, now you can see it. And, it can be, and when it's exposed, then it, then it can be namely exposed to the forgiveness of Jesus. So, when this, so each day is a new day. Um, and then the prayers, Martha knows it, or Marla knows this, sorry, Martha, Marla. Um, each day we ask that the Lord keep us from sin in the morning, and then in the evening we ask the Lord to forgive us for the sins that we did. So we have that cycle again, that in the morning, keep me from sin, in the evening, forgive me for the sins that I did commit, right? And so there's this daily cycle of dying and rising. That's living in your baptism. That's where we get that kind of language when we talk about it. Um, but we talk that way because we actually believe that until we're finally put into the grave, that's, that struggle is real, <laughs> right? I know what God says, but then I also know what I want. And, and those two things are living in opposition to each other day in, day out. More or less, right? Some days worse than others. Some days you're more conscious of it than you are of other days, of that conflict between what I want and what God says. Uh, some people think of baptism then as a, as the beginning of a progression, like you become more and more, I more and more want what God wants and less and less what I want. Um, <laughs> that would be like the, the more holiness um, churches. I'm trying to think of examples of that, that you would be aware of. Uh, some reform teach that, but others don't. Um, so you become more and more pious, more and more churchy, more and more Christian, right? Uh, we don't teach that. We do, th we do say that you progress, but you progress in the knowledge of both God's grace and mercy and of your sin. <laughs> so as you grow older, you learn more and more about your own sin and your capacity for sin, but you also learn more and more about how God forgives, right? And so you're, if, if there is a growth, that's the growth that um, you're driven more and more into your baptism, actually, not away from it, but into it, saying, oh, that was sin too. I didn't even think about it, but that was too. I didn't even, you know, I've been doing that my whole life, right? forgive me, right? And that forgiveness is yours in baptism. So we got there from, well, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. no. there's, a, there's so much that we could say. Baptism in the catechism has four parts. Yeah, we, we should do this since we had all of our questions. Um, the f What's that? Yeah, we did. We did. Well, in part, you'll see that everything just echoes here. First, uh, it's not just plain water. So that's an important note. Some people think of it just as a rite or a ritual. But no, baptism, it has, the power of baptism is by the word of God. So it's included in God's command and combined with God's word. So we've talked about this before, but it's worth uh, reiterating because we'll need it again next week. Is that the physical thing is not the thing. The, the word of God is what does the work. But God attaches his word to a physical thing for the sake of faith. It's set apart for God's use, yes. Right? It's made holy by the word of God. Right? But that, doesn't, that means we can use any water. As long as we attach God's word to it and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The water itself isn't the thing. But, the, but to baptize is to wash with water. And then, water, then you have all the pictures in the Bible about being cleansed with water whether it's your hands or your feet or your whole body or like um, Naaman, who was a leper, who uh, Elisha, yes, Elisha sent to wash in the Jordan seven times and then his body was made clean. It's a beautiful picture of baptism, right? All right. So what word are we talking about? So we're not just saying God's word generic, abstract, but specifically which word? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, therefore go... Disciple making, I changed the translation because make isn't the verb, disciple is the verb. Very confusing. English is not a great language. Go disciple making um, of all nations. So, who's baptism for? Yeah. Ethne is the Greek word, so ethnics. So, it's not specific to one people group, it's all people. Baptizing them, which means to wash with water. But here in specific, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So you get God's name put on you. We usually make the sign of the cross and the forehead and the heart. Um, why would you need a name put on you? If you have animals, you understand putting names on, on an animal. Do you put, like, if you have a cow, you, put, you can put a tag in the ear or branding. If you're a rancher, right? Do we do that around here? 
Do they still brand animals? So you don't? In the United States, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's considered like... It's more of a Western, right, U.S. thing. They don't, they, don't sell, they don't have fencing, so they have to... Oh, right. To, so yeah. So sure they get their cows back. Yeah. In ancient world, it was the same way. Um, because they didn't have fencing. All right. They were nomadic. So mm -hmm. you'd have to indicate whose animals were whose. So you've been marked with a name, branded, right? His name has been etched into you um, so that you can say, you know, I am like they did in the church of Antioch. I'm Christian because I'm of Christ, right? He's made me his own. All right, we'll just close that. We've got a couple more minutes. All right, that's the first part. Second part, what benefits does baptism give? You see how Luther does this. Very simple for children, right? Okay, well, okay, here's what it is. What does it do? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. All right? So Luther makes an assertion here. This is what it does. Three things. Forgive sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation. Well, how do I know that? What are the words and promises? So then he, he quotes Mark 16. Right? That's the end of Gospel of Mark. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That's a pretty direct assertion from Jesus, right? But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now note, a lot of people notice this. Maybe we'll move it up a little bit. A lot of people notice this. What the first clause, believe and baptized, is together. And the second clause, what's missing? Baptism, yeah. Because whether they're baptized or not, if they refuse to believe... They either deny their baptism or they deny baptism altogether. They haven't even been baptized because they don't want it. So baptism is connected to, to faith. And that's why Marla said before, like they go, I think at the beginning, they go together. Like, do I believe and then I'm baptized or do I, am I baptized and then I believe? Yes. <laughs> Every situation is a little bit different, but they always go together. Follow? All right. Then, well, how can this, how can water do these great things? Right. And here's where he quotes Titus chapter three. But we'll do the, we didn't do the first part. It's not just water, right? Because then your shower would be saving you from sin, death, and devil. Maybe sometimes you're a little scummy and it feels that way, right? I never thought of that. Oh, really? The kids always ask that. Well, why, why can't I just take a bath? Like, you know? Sorry. Right. Again, word of God. But the word of God in and with the water does these things. And then here's interesting, along with the faith, which trusts this word of God in the water. So now it does such great things because both we have God's word and we have faith in God's word. Now for this, we, you need to go back to the creed, which we did many weeks ago, right? Um, but, but Jesus and all of Jesus teaching about the gift of the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit works faith as a gift. So both the Holy Spirit is a gift and the Holy Spirit gives faith as a gift. Lots of giving, lots of faith, lots of giving, lots of gifts. Yeah, there we go. Lots of presents for you, right? which, which is beautiful um, because this then applies to baptism, is that baptism is not our work to that point about making a decision for Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. There's a hymn that we don't sing. Um, is that no, Jesus says no one comes to the Father except through me. So without Jesus actually working faith in your heart, you wouldn't believe in him or, or follow him or be baptized or desire the supper, the Lord's Supper, right? Um, that's a testament to actually to faith. You say, when can I receive the supper, right? Uh, and that's worked in you by the Holy Spirit as a gift as well. So uh, this is always going to be a problem, I think, um, for us in that we want to think, we, we want to take... The word is agency. We, we want to be the actors. We want to be the ones doing the things. Like, I worship the Lord, which is true, right? But you wouldn't worship the Lord unless he gave you faith to actually believe in him and trust in him and want to respond with praise and thanksgiving. So the first mover, if you like, or the, the actor is actually God, and, and we are instruments of praise and, and of thanksgiving, if you want to put it that way. You think of your voice as an instrument, which it is. All right, same thing with baptism. Baptism is a gift. What's to prevent me from being baptized? Philip has to say nothing because it's a gift from God for everyone, for all nations, as he said right before he ascended. So without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. There's the answer for the children because they always ask, 
Can I just take a shower or a bath? Okay. <laughs> but with the word of God, it is a baptism. And here we have to be very specific. What does baptism mean? A life-giving water, rich in grace. That is God's giving. That's what grace is. And a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3. Now there's a new idea, but we could also get that from John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. Is that baptism is, is a birthday. Yeah. But not your physical birthday, but your, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should. I, we put them in the bulletin. I don't know if we know everybody's baptism, birthday. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're in the Sunday bulletin for the week previous. So if they're members of the congregation and their information's current, two things that may or may not be true, um, right, with the school. But yeah, we should be able to... There's, a little, there's little songs we could do too. Or we could sing just um, uh, one of the, like a stanza, one of the baptism hymns on those days. Yeah, uh, and which is the greater birth? The birth according to the flesh or the birth according to the spirit? No, it's the spirit. But you can't be born of the spirit without being born of the flesh too. I mean, because you're body and soul, right? But again, without, the, without baptism, what's, what's the long-term prognosis for you? Sin, death, and devil. Yeah, and hell, right? Yeah. Maybe not the lowest tier of hell because you've been pretty decent, right? So maybe just like level one or two. The le yeah, exactly. It <laughs> still be warm. <laughs> uh, that's good. All right, and then Titus 3, which we didn't read. And then the last part, um, this, is, this is where that teaching element comes in. I don't, it's a fine translation, I guess, but what does such baptizing with water indicate or what does it show, if you like? Like, what does it teach us? All right, it indicates or shows that the old Adam, so that's the sinner, in us should, and should is what kind of language? Subjunctive, do you know oh, yes. grammar? I, I, you're you're big into grammar in first grade, yeah. Um, or in not even first grade, preschool. <laughs> before first grade. Kindergarten. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a maybe. Yeah, it's a maybe. So this is what should be happening. <laughs> By daily contrition. Contrition is an old church word, just to mean to be sorry for sin. Mm -hmm. And repentance, that's to turn away from your sin and back to faith in Christ. So should by daily contrition and repentance, Lord help me, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires. So part of you is supposed to die daily in baptism. Crazy idea, right? And that a new man, or new Adam if you like, but here the new man is Jesus, by the way, should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So sometimes people take this and they say, well, there it is. There's where, that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I'm supposed to kill myself each day and I'm supposed to come back, bring myself back to life. Now, when you say it that way, you realize how absurd it sounds, right? Because that's, we're back to the, the picture I think I've shown you before, right? This is my, my favorite illustration for this, you know? You're dead by the roadside and then now what? How are you supposed to get, well get well soon, right? What can a, what can a dead person do? Uh, nothing, right? So don't try to take agency of this. This dying and rising is the work of Jesus through your baptism, by his word, each day, as he shows you your sin, brings you to repent of it. That's not even your work. He's the one that turns you around. Marlon knows how to do this with the kid. And grab him shoulders, turn around. Actually, every parent knows that. You're facing the wrong way. You're in the wrong line. Yeah, exactly. That's what God does. He turns us back to him. Um, he drowns us and dies us under the water. Right? And then he gives us new life in him. Right? Emerging and arising. So think of yourself coming back out of that water each day. You know, there you can think of. Yeah, like a mermaid. I was, I was thinking of Apocalypse Now. I don't know if you've seen that. but Where, where he goes nuts and... And there's the slow-mo coming out of the water in Vietnam. Anyway, doesn't matter. But this is in righteousness and purity forever. So righteousness means, is another way of saying forgiveness. Purity is another way of saying holiness. So where does forgiveness and holiness come from? From our doing or from God's giving? Yeah. 
God's giving. So he declares you righteous. He declares you holy, not because you are in your flesh, but because of his word. So you have that contradiction. He's like, wait a minute, God says I'm his child, but I don't act like it. <laughs> God says I'm forgiven, but then I go back to my sin. God says I'm holy, but then I desecrate myself in various ways by, you know, by my sin. And then he says, no. And then he says to you, no, actually, I died for that. Be forgiven. Be restored. Be resurrected. Over and over. Yeah. <laughs> Try to do better next time. Um, that's what faith says. Yeah, I know. I did everything I need to in church. Right? And so there it is, Romans 6. So um, you can see, I mean, if you take Luther seriously in the way that he just gives us God's word here, there's four parts. Baptism is not an insignificant thing. It's not like a, a little part of what it means to be a Christian, which is how some people treat it. Um, but it is, it, especially the daily part, the ongoing life of the Christian is, is of the baptized. So, you know, you could stay, say each morning, or especially when times of temptation or difficulty, you know, and you say, I'm not sure that God can love me. You say, no, I'm baptized. That's the answer. Jesus, he promised, right? And he keeps his word, even if I don't. <laughs> even when I don't. Right. So then it's, now we're talking, ah, that's significant, because uh, that's the only way out then, is in the forgiveness of Jesus and the promises he's made to me. So how does the baptism, like, for an adult, look? Exactly the same. Exactly the same as a child. Same words. But you can't, he lifts you up and dulls you I was going to say. <laughs> no, no, you would just lean over the font. Yeah, I had a. Uh, oh, you could, um, or at home, or in the at the at the, the wherever you're in the hospital and you're like I'm I'm sick and I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. We've never we've never been that concerned about the amount of water. So some of our churches have fonts where you can do like with an infant with a little water with a young person they have a step they can get up close, or with an adult they can go under the water or you can do any combination thereof. <laughs> It's not the water that is the, I mean, the water is, it needs to be water because that's what baptism is, but, but it's the word of God that, that makes it what it is. And the amount of water, I mean, it is beautiful to, to drown and die in the water because that is what God's word says. So there, well, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful confession of what God's word says happens in baptism. Um, there, right. Yeah, and like, uh, especially the Eastern Church, everybody's immersed. Everybody goes all the way under. Um, some Baptist churches do that too, but the Eastern Church, so you'll see them with the infant, and they'll just watch the videos on YouTube. And they'll dunk the kid out in the water, hold him up, and water comes off, dunk him back in. Oh, and they do it very violently, very violently, down in the water and back up. Yeah. No, I use a lot more water than some pastors do. Some pastors use a little shell and they pour a little bit of water, which is fine too, because then you're kind of making a point that it's the word of God that's the thing and not the amount of water. But I tend to just make a mess. It gets all over my book and it's, just, it's okay. It can be messy. All right, that's it. Now it's time for church. Okay, so my main thing. So um, our 